Welcome to the Lens Rentals Podcast. I'm Ryan Hill. This week, I'm moderating a discussion between Roger Sakala, optical expert at Lens Rentals, and Barney Britton, senior editor at DP Review. For over 20 years, DP Review has been one of the most trusted resources anywhere for camera, lens, and accessory reviews, as well as features and how-to guides. Roger started writing occasional articles for the site this year. He and Barney will cover the possibly scary, hopefully exciting, subject of the future of the photography industry. What will change, what will stay the same, and what kinds of technology the future might bring. Barney, Roger, good morning. Thank you for joining me on the Lentronals podcast. Good morning. morning. Thank you. Uh, So we're going to do this a little bit differently today. This won't be a straight interview. I want to kind of uh, just moderate a discussion between both of you. So, you know, we we get answers from the two of you for all of these questions. And we're going to be talking in general about the mysterious future where you both see the industry growing and what's going to change. And I want to start with Barney. What products in the last few years have surprised you the most? Uh, Not best or worst necessarily, but what has been the most unexpected? Mm. I think, honestly, not a great deal in the past few years has has really surprised me. It's sort of been a continuation of fairly well established trends. The industry has sort of the, the 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 form that the industry is in now. The template for that was sort of set. I would think I would say around two thousand and seven, two thousand eight. Um, with the emergence of the of the modern smartphone, but there have been a few products in the last few years which have emerged to serve needs that neither the smartphone nor the traditional camera can um, can meet. And I think the biggest of those would be the uh, you know the huge growth in in things like um, like gimbals for a smartphone video and also for a traditional camera video, but also just I mean drones, drones and things like that, things that you could just weren't possible or in, in no way financially feasible. The emergence of incredibly compact 4K video platforms, basically, which can augment genuinely professional productions for a pretty small outlay. In the more traditional uh, manufacturers, in the more traditional camera space, I have been quite surprised by Leica, actually, uh, making such a concerted move with products like the SL2 into being taken very seriously by videographers. In some ways, the SL2, at the point where it was launched, was actually a more powerful video camera than the Panasonic S1R, uh, on which you know, the technology from which it was based, um, which is pretty pretty bold, fairly unexpected from a company like Leica. Um, you know, they've also made, though there's some controversy around the fees that they attach to it, they also made one of the best uh, wireless apps of any manufacturer. Um, so yeah, Leica's surprising. They're still hanging in there. Leica has a lot, has a fair amount of freedom, uh, an amount of freedom which I think a lot of other manufacturers would envy because it is a low volume, high cost, you know, niche heritage brand, um, which actually allows them to take some risks. What's been surprising is that they've just they've they haven't just stuck with what has always worked for Leica. They actually have made forays into fairly high technology. I think the the other thing that I would throw in here, a little bit less surprising, but it surprised me as an optics guy, is uh, the fact that uh, manufacturers seem to be okay with smaller apertures now. Uh, the the f eleven lenses from Canon are a good case. Of, that their one hundred five hundred is an f seven one at the long end for an L lens. That would have been something unheard of a few years ago. So I think that's a little surprising to me. And I'm going to throw an opposite surprise. If you had asked me six years ago, would all the manufacturers that were currently involved still be involved today? I would have said no, yet they all are. Mm, That's a good point, actually. Yeah, I think a lot of people talked about, in the industry, a lot of people were sort of whispering your 2019, 2020. Those are going to be the years. Those are going to be the years where we see people drop out or, or, you know, it's do or die, which did happen. You know, we have seen Olympus. um, Obviously, Olympus divested itself of the imaging division, but it was sold to a company who seems genuinely committed to actually maintaining a product line. That that did surprise me too, because that company has not historically done that. No, it's interesting, isn't it? They do seem to, if you look at their, you know, if you go to the Olympus Imaging websites now, now that the transfer is complete, um, they very much are positioning the camera products as other products alongside their very, very, very diverse portfolio. <laughs> so it's like, but, you know, they're also positioning them for, you know, products for products for law enforcement, products for cine production, you know, products for, I think the one I saw was was real estate. So there's like, there's a little real estate tab on their site, which will tell you the best cameras that they make for real estate photography, you know, so 
It's interesting. We'll see how that shakes out in the next year or so. But from talking to people inside Olympus Camera, as was um, now GIP, they seem genuinely very confident that product will continue to be released and the roadmap will be honoured and people who have bought into the OMD system will maintain, you know, will have support maintained for them and, and will have cameras and lenses continuing to be marketed, which is great. I think another thing which I saw, which I had on my list actually, was products like the Canon EOS R5. You know, surprising coming from a company like Canon who, you know, we've traditionally sort of rolled our eyes a little bit at how conservative that company can be. And with the R5, they just threw everything at the wall, almost arguably to a fault, perhaps. Uh, it was a Sony-like maneuver. I mean, they really did. Very, yes. A Sony, but, you know, with the Canon ergonomics and all that other stuff that people like. Ironically, in the same year that Sony went conservative and pulled the A7S III, which doesn't do 8K and doesn't do, you know, doesn't have any crazy headline grabbing tricks, but is as a consequence, arguably the best camera of its type on the market because it doesn't try to do too much. It just does what you need extremely well. That's a, that's a perfect transition to my ne next question, which is what company or companies do you think is in the best position to thrive in the next, say, five years? I think you'd have to say Canon because Canon is so diversified as a company which allow you know, which gives it enormous flexibility and and a degree of security. Although no company will ever will ever support a, not an unprofitable division forever. That's a fantasy. But I think Canon is so diversified; they're in a very strong position. And also, they're a very vertically integrated company. I mean, Canon makes everything from, you know, they they really do everything in house. Um, and there are costs associated with that, and there are risks associated with that. And I think that may be the reason for the perceived relatively slow pace of their development in the past few years. But the fact is, I mean, they make everything from the, the glass and the lenses, you know, to the machines that make the prototypes. Canon makes all of it. And I've been to their facilities and it's really quite, quite extraordinary. They don't have to rely on third party technology suppliers in anything like the same extent that other companies do. So I think Canon, for those reasons, is in a very strong position. They have a very good user base, very strong user base. They're perhaps, at this point, the most, the strongest, most established brand, I would say, in the camera space. But there's no doubt that Sony is right there with them. I think Canon's automation is probably industry leading also. And that's, that's a big thing. Yeah, from <clears throat> excuse me, from what little I've seen um, at the at Sonomaya um, lens manufacturing plant, the QC and the automation of the QC is really quite unlike anything I have ever seen anywhere else. Which is not to say that there aren't locked rooms in other facilities that I've been into where things haven't been happening. But you tend to find with companies that know they're onto something, they do quite like showing it off. I think if anybody else had that level of automation in their QC, I would have seen it at some point. <laughs> um, but, you know, everyone, everyone gets there at different speeds. You mentioned Leica as an example of a company that has sort of found its niche. You know, it, it's never going to be, Leica is never going to be as huge a entity as Canon or Sony, but they found their market and they're successful in that market. Are there other companies that you think have like successfully carved out a niche in a similar way? Oh, without a doubt. I mean, Fujifilm is probably the other most obvious one. Although Fujifilm, you know, has ambitions beyond being simply a niche, you know, traditional styled retro camera manufacturer. Um, Fujifilm is also a technology company, an optics company and everything else. And I think we've seen Fujifilm move away a little bit away from the, the button and dial laden uh, retro style cameras in recent years. I mean, Fujifilm made the most impressive product of last year, in my opinion, which was the GFX 100. Who the hell makes a 100 megapixel medium format ILC with built-in stabilization that's no bigger than a Nikon D5? Yeah, I think Fujifilm is, is, a, is a company who have found an extreme... This is very, very, very anecdotal. Um, but on, on DP Review, we have a relatively good sense of how popular the different brands are with our audience, just based on comments, engagement, and you know traffic, things like that. But we pretty much know that if we if we produce a review of a Fujifilm camera or a Fujifilm camera is launched and we do a, you know, what you need to know article where we get our hands on it and tell you what the spec points are, we are guaranteed a level of traffic, which is not necessarily, you know, not necessarily the case with, with some of our other brands. People really, really, really like Fujifilm. On the other side of that coin, 
who do you think is in we'll we'll say a less good uh position to weather the next five years it's very 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 hard for me to say that because you know i I'm on the editorial side of our business. I have limited insight into exactly how the the global industry works. I think COVID <laughs> COVID has thrown the industry into I, th I think people don't quite realize quite how fundamental the disruption caused by COVID was and continues to be. Um there are some come some some companies who are set up a little better to cope with that and there are some who've really been hit hard by it just through in some ways just you know, being in the wrong place at the wrong time. The one that I'm thinking of is um, is Nikon has had a pretty has had a pretty tough year because they have some manufacturing in China. COVID severely disrupted that. In fact, COVID disrupted the supply of components to pretty much every manufacturer uh, earlier on this year. But Nikon's also been transitioning all of its manufacturing from um, its remaining manufacturing in Japan is being transitioned to Thailand during this period of time. Um, so it's made it very difficult for Nikon in Japan to send engineers to Thailand for quality control and for training and things like that. At the same time, I think what a lot of people don't realize is that manufactured goods, the way they get to you, the consumer typically, is they actually come in the cargo holds of passenger aircraft. An awful lot of manufactured goods are transported in you know, underneath your seat. So. If you've got manufacturing in a place like Thailand and no one's flying to Thailand, no airlines are flying to Thailand, no airlines are flying anywhere, um, you're gonna have a problem getting your getting your goods out. You're gonna have backups, you're gonna have delays. It's a logistical nightmare because the entire industry works on a just-in-time um, logic where capacity is there when you need it, but there's no excess, there's no waste. When it, when a bump is thrown into that process, anywhere in the anywhere in the process, it actually creates significant amount of, of of chaos. So I think Nikon's had a pretty hard time with that. Some fairly well publicized delays in some of their lenses. That's clearing out now. That's getting better. The products they're making are really good, but their financials have been pretty concerning. Although an awful lot of that has actually been you know one off costs, writing off the costs of product lines which are being deprecated in Japan, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So. I think Nikon's going to come. I think Nikon's going to consolidate. It's going to restructure a little bit. I think Nikon's going to be fine. Uh, no one's too big to fail, but I think Nikon, in terms of the brand and the power and the legacy of that brand, I don't think Nikon's going to go anywhere. But I know they've had a tough year. I have to agree with that. I, I I'm not as comfortable with their 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 future financially. I think they're secure. Like you said, their write offs have been done and over, and they've got they've got finances, but they're basically in the same. Field, they're they're in the same arena with Canon and Nikon. They don't have a product niche, and I think that puts them in a very difficult position because they size wise seem to be heading to become a, a a niche manufacturer. Yet they don't have a niche product. So I'm I'm a little concerned about Wither Nikon. Well, you know what what I think about that. I think the I think quite honestly the what we might call in quotes the traditional camera industry. I think that entire industry will pivot towards what you might arguably call niche products because we've already seen the complete erosion of the low end which is a very profitable market segment the compact camera and zoom camera zoom compact market segment which has basically just disappeared that was where an awful lot of the profit was for these companies so you're looking at a situation where regardless of anything else manufacturers are already having to pivot to established customers, experienced customers, customers who don't need, who aren't picking up a blister pack in Best Buy necessarily, who know what they want, who know what they need, and are prepared to pay for it. You will have to pay more for your lenses now and into the future. You just, you just will. But you know that you're getting much, much more for your $2,000 now than you would have been 10 or 15 years ago. But yeah, that new lens is going to cost $2,000. Sorry, the last one cost $1,500 because we're not, they're not making hundreds of thousands of them anymore. They can't offset the cost against millions of dollars in revenue from compact cameras anymore because that revenue doesn't exist. I think the entire industry is actually shifting towards what you might arguably call a bit more of a niche customer base. As companies like DJI pop up and do what Canon and Nikon have, have tried to do, which is give smartphone users something that their phone can't give them, I wonder, and I don't know, you may have a better idea of this than me, but the average age of the photography uh, enthusiast these days is, I suspect it's it's going up steadily. 
Yeah, it's funny. I would, I don't know my perspective on that. I, I used to work in cam in camera retail for a long time before I became a um, before I became a member of <laughs> a member of the uh, fake news media, and um, <laughs> and I've worked in camera stores all over you know the north of England for for a good few years. And the average age of the customers that came into our store was always pretty high. <laughs> You know, it was always the guys who just wanted to come and talk to someone about their lenses and what they should buy and they're retiring and whatever, you know. It's always been, in my experience of retail in the enthusiast and high-end space, it's always been a fairly old, fairly male demographic. Um, so I don't know. I don't know about that. I, I, I'm sure you're I, think you're, I think you're right. I think, without a doubt, the majority of pictures are being taken by people who are not that demographic now. But whether the market for, for mid-range and high-end cameras has changed all that much demographically or not, I would hesitate to say. I, it's shrunk, but I don't know whether the kinds of pe I don't know whether the kind of average buyer has changed all that much. But I, I really, I really, really don't know. And I know it is different all over the world. You know, for example, the, the, the customer demographics in Asia are radically different to the customer demographics in the US, for example. You mentioned DJI earlier. Barney, and it, it's difficult to think of DJI as a new company because they've become so ubiquitous in so many different markets. But relative, especially to like Canon and Nikon, they are pretty new. Um, are there other new companies that have sparked your interest recently? I would say most of the the new companies that I kind of inevitably, you know, they pop up in the accessory space um, because you don't see a new company pop up and be like, you know, we're going to take on Canon. <laughs> We're gonna take. We've got a Kickstarter. We're gonna make a Nikon Z seven two six uh, competitor. You see it in lenses sometimes, though. You do. You do in cameras. You don't see it much. You see it a lot. In, you see it in lenses, and you do see it in um, in accessories. So companies that I've sort of had my eye on are in what I, what I would call the unsexy end of the of the industry. You know, tripods, camera bags, little doodads that you always knew you wanted, but no one ever made, and. Five other people like you decided to make a Kickstarter and suddenly here it is. You know, those are the kind of companies that I've sort of seen emerging like Peak, Peak Design. You know, it didn't come out of nowhere, but Peak Design has got a really, really good track record of finding the very few gaps left <laughs> in, um, in, the, in the market and, and putting really smart products into them with really smart marketing attached to them. Um, but yeah, they're smart. They've got good marketing. Um, they make good products, and they they have a, a good track record. Yeah, of finding of, of making things that do something that you know no one else really does. I mean, that Peak Design travel tripod. I actually sort of semi tested it recently against um, a much more competitor, a much more sorry, much more expensive competitor. And um, there's still nothing that really does what that tripod does. A lot of compromises, obviously, but um, you know it is tiny. It only measures, I think, it measures less than three inches in diameter. It's super slim and everything else. And as a tripod purely for travel and for hiking and for moving around, it's pretty much un unmatched. Point. I think I have seen some manufacturers pop up, um, new and innovative manufacturers, typically in their ex in the accessory space. But I think Roger can speak to um, third party lens guys a bit more. Uh, cogently than I can. Well, I, I don't know if I, I can speak to anyone in particular, but there's several. I, I, I refer to them as boutique manufacturers. They've uh, come in, they're making sometimes excellent lenses. Very often they're manual lenses, which is, you know, a, a niche by itself, but they're good quality. And it's become easy to make a lens of reasonable quality, particularly if you don't have autofocus algorithms in it. So it's a pretty simple thing to do. And, uh, it's interesting. I'm not a big fan, but there certainly seem to be a lot of fans of them. We get requests all the time for, are you going to carry the, uh, you've never heard of it, brand uh, 58 0.95 lens from so I don't know. Um, so those are interesting to me. And I think uh, there's some lenses in there, uh, you know, I never would have thought of making, but but they're they're definitely of interest. So, With respect to the to the manual lenses issue, how and you have a better sense of this than me without breaking any NDAs. But how much of the reason for the fact that we do, you know, there are Z mount lenses out there right now. There are Nikon, uh, sorry, there are Canon R mount lenses out there right now, which are th entirely manual. How much of the reason for that is that it's just simpler? Like there's no, IP, there's there's less IP. You don't have to pay licenses for the algorithms. You don't have to. It's almost entirely that. And in a lot of cases, it's not paying for the algorithms. It's re paying someone to reverse engineer the algorithms that then may change on you and leave your lens non-functioning. So I, I think that it's, uh, 
you can go to China and buy a lens design for a very little money. Uh, very often it's a copy of an older lens design that's no longer patented or it's changed just a bit. You can go to another company in China and get them to make the glass for you. You can go to a third company who will put it in a housing. And with you know basically no investment but some money, you've now got a lens with your name on the side of it. So that's simple to do. Uh, once you start getting into electronics, it's a lot less simple. Somebody has to sit down and reverse engineer the the electronics. Big companies do it. Um, let's see, how do I not do a non-disclosure? A, a company who made some mounts that had to know the electronics of the cameras they were making to, I worked with and they were going to come out with a new one. And they're like, but we have to wait for Charlie because he's gone camping for two months. And I'm like, who's Charlie? Charlie's the guy who does all the electronics, who reverse engineers all the, the mounts and programs them in a chip. It's a guy who goes camping for two months. So, you know, this this doesn't give me great confidence sometimes. So, I mean, there's, there's two things. You correct me if I'm wrong here. There's, the, my understanding is two things. One is that supporting – so if you look at a company like Sigma, for Sigma to support as, le- as many lens mounts as it does is, is, a hu- is logistically a pretty big overhead. To add any more mounts to that increases the overhead even further. But my other, the other thing which I understand, and you'll, you'll correct me if I'm wrong here, is that the physical dimensions of a new mount are not protected in the same way as the electronic algorithms dictating the transfer of data within that mount. So you can, my understanding is that you can make pretty easily, pretty cheaply, you can make something that will physically mount, let's say, on a Nikon Z7. Sure. And no one's going to stop you. Nobody can patent 47 millimeters. Right. But you can't, what you can't do easily, cheaply, or necessarily legally, what you can't do is create an autofocus algorithm that will speak to a Nikon camera at the other end of it. I think you'd have to re-engineer it. You could, you could certainly re-engineer legally something that takes this many pulses and makes it this much movement, et cetera. You can't copy what they already have. You can license it. Five or six years ago, I, I don't think you could. Uh, the big companies wouldn't speak to you. I think they're much more willing to discuss it now, particularly when you have companies that Nikon and Canon both come out, not Canon, let's say Nikon as an example. They've come out with a new mount. They don't have a full set of lenses for it. And while they don't want somebody to make lenses in general to take Nikon sales, right now they might be willing to consider it. All right, we'll take a quick break there. And when we come back, we'll have more from Roger and Barney. If you only know lens rentals from our yelling about cameras on the internet, there's more to the story. We're actually the largest online videography and photography equipment rental house in the entire world. Cameras, lenses, lights, audio, drones, just about anything. Here's how it works. Just go to lensrentals.com and tell us what you need and when you need it. We ship it straight to you in protective cases. You use it for whatever your heart desires, then ship it back to us with the included return label. Next time you need equipment for a shoot, head to lensrentals.com slash podcast for a discount on your order. That's lensrentals.com slash podcast. Welcome back to the Lens Rentals podcast. I'm talking with Roger Sakala and Barney Britton about the future of the photography industry, and the conversation is going so well that we didn't actually take a break during recording. The momentum just couldn't be stopped, so we'll catch up right where we left off. One of the one of the things that I always liked about in-person events was catching up with people who I've known for a really, really long time. And there's fewer and fewer of them every time. Well, that's a nice segue to Ryan's next to last question. I, uh, trade the, shows, you trade mean? Shows? Yeah, trade shows and in-person gatherings. Yeah, and I don't even mean because of COVID purposes, although obviously they've been paused because of COVID purposes. But I, I'm, I get the feeling that this pause has shown people that they're not a necessity. And do you think trade shows are going to go away? I don't know. I mean, we've been saying, it's been years and years, we've been saying, well, the traditional trade show, essentially, it, it felt, it really did feel like the traditional trade show industry, because it, it is an industry, probably needed something like this to happen, because they absolutely had to make the move away from the model that they'd established 50 years ago. And they were just doing it so slowly and something like this came along and was like oh fuck it <laughs> all right this is the year we have to act okay we actually do have to do we talked about it for 10 years let's do a virtual show because we can't 
literally can't do a physical show. So it's been very painful, I'm sure, but I think it's forced companies and it's forced the companies which which exist to put on shows to be as creative as and as imaginative in solving the problem as they probably should have been a little earlier. But because money was coming in and it was working just well enough, I think, I don't know, I don't have any insight into this, but my sense is that we've been talking for so long about like, well, I'm not sure how long Vodakina is going to be around, you know, because it was always obvious that it wasn't working in the way that it had been. I can say from the, and Ryan, you, you've been around for this, but from an exhibitor standpoint, every year we sat down and would go, well, the trade shows were not worth the money. I, I liked going to trade shows to go see everybody and talk to everybody, but exhibiting at trade shows was an incredible pain in the ass. It was always very expensive, and we would look and go, you know, we could have spent this money on advertising or anything else and gotten a better return on our investment. Yeah, and companies, uh, and you know, company, it, it, we already were seeing com- manu- camera manufacturers, big companies, making that exact same decision as well. I mean, your perspective is different; it's very valuable because it's very different to mine on trade shows. You know, our ex- the expenses associated with trade shows for me are just plane tickets and hotels, but even even then the only trade show which paid its way, in my opinion, as a, as a senior editorial writer, was CP Plus in Japan, because that was the only one that gave us something that we couldn't get anywhere else, which was direct access to all the most important people in the industry at an executive level. And talking to everyone else, the main reason most people exhibited at trade shows was they were afraid if they weren't there, people would notice. Exactly. And I think that was really sort of what I was driving at earlier on. I think COVID-19 has given everybody the ex- not the excuse. That sounds like a very reductive word. But it's provided a reason where they can go, okay, let's actually audit this. This doesn't really work for us anymore. Or the other thing that might happen, um, I'm going to make a bit of a fringe prediction here, is that once, quote unquote, life gets back to normal, um, I think we may actually see an increase in demand for physical events, which will manifest in unexpected ways. And I think there are some companies, I'm thinking Sony specifically, who've put a lot of energy into making quite imaginative and innovative in-person events. I can see companies trying to take advantage of that. I think there will be an appetite in 2022, late 2021, 2022, for the kind of things that we've been hankering after. Because we've all said the things that we like about trade shows are the meeting people, catching up with people, connecting, right? They didn't work as a means by which to sell cameras, to sign contracts. They, 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 they probably stopped working to do that, which was their original entire purpose. <laughs> but they work really, really well as, as networking events, as places to get inspired and to, to, you know, to fanboy or fangirl your favorite photographer who's up on stage. I don't think the demand or desire for that will go away. And I do think that we'll see companies trying to be trying to cater to that in imaginative ways. So that's my fringe prediction. Not that trade shows will go away completely, but that they will come back different. So this may be a little too broad. And coming from the perspective of a videographer, I I don't have as much experience in the photography side. I'm curious if either of you think there is a technology incoming that could drastically shake up the photography market. And from the video's perspective, I'm thinking specifically of the transition to like consumer available HD in like the early 2000s uh, that sort of increased the resolution of available video cameras, but drove so much more in terms of video being used as a reliable medium for cinema. Is a change that big still something that can happen in the photography market? Yes, absolutely. Yeah. Do you want to go first, Roger? Do you want to go first? Well, mine's weird. Why don't you do something mainstream? Oh, mine's weird. Oh, okay. Um, cool. Mine is um, something that a lot of people will not um, will, will 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 not know what this is. But global shutter is the next thing, which has the potential to fairly seriously shake up um, traditional uh, traditional still imaging. Um, essentially, what global shutter refers to, what the term refers to, is um, is a technology by which, and Roger will correct me on the details of this if I mangle them, which I probably will. A uh, technology by which a shutter can be read out without the need the signal from a shutter. Sorry, the signal from a sensor can be read out without the need for a physical um, metal shutter, which has 
Physical shutters have been the means by which we regulate exposure for as long as photography exists. Uh, global shutter technology basically would would ob obviate the need for that mechanical um, um, movement, well, obviate the need for that mechanical component altogether. So global shutter, the, the lack of global shutter is the reason that cameras are the, the size that they are in some cases. There are things that manufacturers could do with sensors that have global shutter, which they cannot do right now in terms of the form factor of the product. They would not need to be governed by the same restraints um, or constraints as they are currently. So global shutter has the potential to allow for uh, increased modularity, just to pick something off the top of my head. Um, you know, you don't have to, eat, there's less less space required inside the camera for the, me for the mechanics. Um, you know, the sensor can uh, can exist, can can be put into a smaller, a smaller space. So you can imagine modular cameras becoming a reality with global shutter, which you couldn't do now. I'll throw in the global shutter and on sensor focusing basically means a camera and a chip. Effectively, yeah. And pretty much everything is happening just on the sensor at that point, yeah. Yeah. And my other one would be battery technology. I think we, we've lived with lithium ion now for a very, very, very long time. Um, I just read this morning about a, a new car battery technology that allows for five minute charging. You better believe that stuff is coming to all of consumer electronics. It, it's probably starting in the automotive industry. But given how how big and powerful and influential in terms of research and development that a company like Panasonic is in the battery world in general, um, you better believe that we're look, we're, we're going to be looking at you know enormous capacity fast charging batteries coming to pretty much all of all of consumer electronics, all of CE. So that also I think has the potential to transform the way cameras look um, and the way that they are and the way that they that they operate. So those are my two. Those are awesome. Uh, <laughs> and I, I'm really impressed. I, mine is kind of unworthy. It won't have as big an effect as his, but I think it's going to come. And that is we now have better and better algorithms to correct lenses that are out of focus, defocused, whatever. I think the day is coming not too long from now. When you buy a lens and the first thing you'll do is plug it in your camera, take two or three test pictures with it of a given target, and the camera will then have put into firmware or perhaps into your computer's uh, processing program exactly all the defects of the lens and how they should best be corrected. And suddenly all that stuff I do with MTF benches is going to be far less important than it used to be. Well, some of that is already, this isn't quite the same thing, but I'm, you, you know this, I think we've just, we've, I think we've discussed it. Manufacturers are already writing in a lot of individual lens characteristics into the firmware of those lenses so that they can, when the lens comes back in for service or refurbishment, they can measure it against its original QC figures. They, they can, although those QC figures are sufficient for the manufacturers, but not sufficient that you would use them to adjust your image. In other words, they're, they're usually working on a 20 line pair frequency for the geeks amongst you. Whereas with your image fine detail, you're looking at 50 to 70 to 80 line pairs. I remember Canon being very, very proud of the fact that they were baking in individual lens characteristics into each lens. And a couple of companies, Sigma first among them, they're actually doing really good lens testing. Uh, mm -hmm. the oh, yeah. Sigma's actually for maybe maybe still now, but for a while, Sigma, I think, had the most sophisticated per lens QC. Canon's secretive, so I don't know. But they may be up with Sigma, but Sigma was far and away the best. But my point is that not just an individual lens now, We you, you see it on your forums, I sure do. 1,400 posts about, is my lens a little softer in the right upper corner, or is it tilted, or is it this, or is it that? And basically, the the technology is there, although not in a chip yet, that we could take your lens, take several test images at, say, different focusing ranges, uh, focusing distances if it's a zoom, and then the camera could then correct every image with that lens. So if it's a little decentered, a little tilted, whatever, it would correct it, and what comes out is totally different than what goes in which I think is, is going to be very doable fairly soon. Um, whether the cost is worth it, I don't know, but I think that's going to be a big deal. I guess something else we should say too, I didn't, this, this, this was not on my, on the list of the, the first two things I mentioned because it's more like it already exists, but I think we're only going to see the importance of computational photography grow. We're, we're only going to see the, the definition of traditional exposure get more and more and more muddy. 
Well, Barney, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you for taking the time. We really appreciate it. Thank you. It's fun. Oh, wait, I, one question. I'm going to ask it, if it, and it may not make the fun. Yeah, episode. absolutely. Barney, who do you read or watch online? Um, I don't know if I can give you a very satisfying answer to that, actually, because I, I, tend, I, I keep an eye on people in our space for various for various reasons without going too specific. Um, but I, I keep an eye on what's happening. Um, I keep an eye on what's being discussed. And because very often the way Deep Review does things is we're, we're very methodical. We're very careful. And that's the reason I think why we've earned the trust of manufacturers now for 20 something years. We really, really try hard not to rush out with first impressions. We try very hard to make sure that we, 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 we caveat, we, you know, trust and verify. We, we, we do all that, which does sometimes mean that, you know, we'll still be working through our tests when someone says something like, oh my God, the Canon EOS R5 overheats. And we may just not have got to that yet. So I keep an eye on a lot of sites who are a little bit more, and I mean, no, no disrespect by saying this whatsoever, who are a little bit more entertainment oriented than, than, than we are. Um, I do keep an eye on them because they're very good at finding things like that. They're very good at finding, reacting, and putting stuff up pretty much immediately. And that that's very that's a very, very useful purpose. I'm not sniffy about those those sites. Mostly YouTubers, actually. I'm not sniffy about them at all. I do respect what they do and especially the work required to do what they do. I mean, people are very, are very um dismissive sometimes of, of people like Jared um Frono's photo, but there is not a harder working person in the entire industry than that guy. <laughs> You know, it's very, very, very hard to do what he does, ditto the Northrups and, and everybody else. The people who I watch in our industry, I really enjoy Chris and Jordan. We've obviously, we've brought them in-house now, but we wanted them on board because they're they're good at what they do. They're, they're right, you know, they're right a lot and they're funny. They're funny to watch. They have a good dynamic and they're very hardworking and they're very, very professional. Um, I also really enjoy Gordon Lang. Um, he's very conscientious. Even if you don't want to read through the whole reviews, he's very, very, very good at taking the nearest thing that I've ever seen to pretty repeatable real world test images of lens and lenses I'm talking about specifically. And I think by the time you've looked through all of his images and you've read his reports and you've read about, you know, whether he had to get a second or a third sample of a lens or whatever else, you've got a pretty good idea of what you're gonna get when you when you buy the lens. The other sites that I look at, not to drag this answer out too long, I actually tend to take a lot of ideas and inspiration from sites that are completely outside of our vertical. Um, because we are necessarily quite a specialist site, um, there's a risk there that you can end up being quite blinkered. But, you know, I'm obviously I'm British and the, B the BBC is on my desktop pretty much the entire time. The BBC is one of those grand, long established companies who actually made a very smart and continually evolved their online presence. They made a very smart transition to online. So I keep an eye on what companies like that, like big legacy companies like the BBC, Washington Post, New York Times, what they're doing to answer their readers' questions and what they're doing to present information in an entertaining way. Um, I try and make a point of, of taking a lot of ideas and inspirations from them because there is a risk of getting too deep inside um, one's own, one's own uh, industry and there are a lot of good ideas out there. That's where I go for my U.S. news. <laughs> I really do. Well, me too. Yeah, me too. I have the BBC. I have BBC Radio on pretty much, you know, twelve hours a day and everything else it's, because it's, it's much better to get it from an ocean away. I think <laughs> it really is. Yeah, <laughs> it's funny though. Whenever I do, whenever I go home, which obviously hasn't been for a little while for obvious reasons, whenever I go home, all the BBC programs I listen to in Seattle are eight hours earlier. <laughs> Ah, yeah. then they are. So it's very weird. My time, my schedule's all off. Like, oh yes, that's, that's right. PM is not at ten in the morning. PM is at five PM because that's why it's called PM. Things like that. It's very esoteric. Sorry, I'm sure this is not target audience. I'm sure nobody will know what we're talking. No, about. but it's interesting to me. I enjoyed it. Ryan can cut it all. <laughs> no, I agree. Ryan, you can cut it. Where where I can get like reliable international news and watch all creatures great and small is. Go oh yeah, well, you know, I'm I'm that's the town I'm from. Oh really? Yeah, I'm from um, I'm from Thirsk, which was where the real James Harriet's veterinary surgery was. Ah, uh, that's fantastic. Yeah, we're gonna have to do a full second episode about all creatures, great and small. <laughs> he, he calls it uh, Darby in the books, but it's it's Thirsk. I I want to do a second episode just because this was fun and I didn't get the best <laughs> to talk about. It's good. Yeah, this, was was, this really was a blast, Barney. Thank you. No, you're very welcome. Anytime. I like. Um, I like talking. I haven't had a lot. Of, I haven't had as much opportunity to talk to people as I would normally have had. 
My pleasure. And uh, I'll get you some uh, ideas maybe in the next day or two. About what yeah, please do. I need them on my desk by five o'clock today. Uh, yes, sir. On it. All right. <laughs> Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thanks for listening to the Lynn Journal's podcast. Roger's articles for DP review will be linked to in the show notes. And if you're interested in those, but somehow haven't been to the site before now, I can't recommend it more highly. The technical expertise and attention to detail in their work is pretty much unmatched anywhere else. And hey, check out Wild Creatures Great and Small while you're at it. The Lens Rentals podcast is a production of LensRentals.com. If you've got a question or topic you'd like covered on the show, email us at podcast at LensRentals.com or leave us a voicemail at 901-609-LENS. That's 901-609-LENS. If you're enjoying the show, please review us on iTunes and subscribe in your podcast app of choice. Make sure to check the show notes for a link to this week's coupon code. And as always, Roger Sakala will leave you with an inspirational quote. Adults are just obsolete children, so the hell with them. Dr. Seuss.